Hi everyone, welcome to the Firefish Software Future of Rec Crowdcast. I'm your host Cameron McLennan. Joining me today is Alan Hiddleston. Say hi Alan. Hi <laughs> and, Alan. <laughs> and Steve Ward. Hello Cameron. Hey Steve, thanks very much for uh, joining us today, really appreciate it. Um, could you start off just by telling the audience a little bit about yourself? Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm Steve Ward. I've been in recruitment land for 23 years, which means, God, I must have started about seven years old or something. Um, but I've been doing recruitment for a long time, but particularly in the last 10 years, heavily in the digital and social media space. That's been my kind of playground for the last 10 years. Um, used to run an agency called Cloud9, which uh, was well known for its work within the social media field uh, for a number of years. Um, and a year ago, stepped away, it was literally a year ago, stepped away from that to go and carry out some consulting work with some various people who wanted me to do interesting stuff, uh, usually around digital, usually around enabling uh, better digital um, angles on recruiting, hiring, and and monitoring the way that talent finds work these days and pulling the two together, basically. But uh, yeah, still heavily doing a lot of stuff around the social media field because it keeps changing and keeps moving. So it's um, um, so I do that in-house. Um, uh, both from a consulting and training point of view and, and also agencies as well. I, do, I consult with CEOs on how to um, how to raise their branding and profile and that kind of stuff to help their agency brand. So pretty much captures me now. Plus a few other things, but you don't need to know about them. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. okay, that's a great intro, Steve. Obviously, we've we've spoken before uh, on our uh, podcast. Stephen, uh, uh, Steve is the second highest listens of all time on the Predictive Recruitment <laughs> Podcast. So, if you've not listened to it already, I recommend that if you're into social selling and growing your business through social media, go and check out the Predictive Recruitment Podcast with Steve Ward. Get him the extra listens that he needs to to get above Greg Savage on the, the league table. <laughs> We can make it happen. <laughs> um, so obviously we've spoken before, Steve. So I'm, I'm well aware of, of um, you know some of the experience that you have, but um, in t and you've become really well respected in the industry in terms of you know social media recruiting. But how has it really helped you in terms of the candidate attraction side? So you know why do you feel like you know that's given you an advantage over other recruiters in terms of candidate attraction over, over the years? Well, I mean, obviously, visibility is an important part of that, but it's kind of started with never considering candidates and clients to be two different things. So uh, in Cloud9 land, we never used to um, separate the two. We never considered one set of people to be a bunch of cattle lions and one bunch of set of people. We treated the industry as a, as a whole um, as equal uh, regardless of whether a brand new grad or whether they're the, the head digital person in a major agency or major organization. And we treated people exactly the same and considered that each of them um, had the same contribution to what we were involved in. So, mm -hmm. but, and a, a lot of, so one of that is a, therefore about how we treated people was, was hugely important. I mean, in, mm -hmm. in the way that we looked after people, um, but the social media aspect really was, uh, word, the big word is visibility. We want to be seen. Yeah. Um, Two, I'm going to use the word credible. It's a word I use a lot, but credibility comes from living and breathing what people do and say to each other rather than purely mm -hmm. by hearsay alone. And by being right in the mix with that candidate stroke client kind of network, um, we were part of the conversation. We were learning at the same speed as our candidates. We're on the pulse of the news at the same time as what's going on. So rather than being a, I, I always use the analogy of kind of like being a, if, if the industry was a pond, we wouldn't be the little um, little gnome on the side fishing, which is what recruitment agencies tend to be quite a lot, hoping yeah. to get some bites. We'd be in the middle on a lily pad grabbing the fish as they, you know, we're right in the midst of it all really and cajoling with the industry. And that made us very visible. And the bit, and the other third part of it after visible and credible is also accessible. Um, mm. The biggest part is how many places can you be accessible to, to candidates? And we regarded mm. that as being a very important uh, way to run a recruitment agency. And Steve, were you doing that with the foresight of the fact that you might have candidates, candidates that have become clients further down the line and vice versa? To a degree, yeah. I mean, that's always been an old age old kind of philosophy that never treat, you know, always regard that a candidate could become a client one yeah. day. Um, 
I still think that's a kind of slightly cynical way of looking at it. I think, you know, we, we kind of have that thing of like, well, candidates are only candidates. So, but one day they might pay some money and be a client, you know, and there'd be a real kind of, uh, yeah. part. You know, to yeah. me, the, it's the influence of one over another. And it's the, uh, it's the way that the word of mouth effect works. And we considered the fact that it's, uh, you know, if you, you, you could sit with the least, most least experienced person within the industry, but you don't know who the next five people that, that person is going to meet and who they will influence sure. with the words that they say. So, and it could be their father, their uncle, their brother. They can walk into their office and tell the story to their colleagues who have uh, who have more experience. And and what we were looking at all the time is how do you pass on word of mouth? Um, word of mouth is a is is a is a human thing, but it's also um, very prevalent through social media and that's one of the areas in which social media is at its best for agencies is is the the word of mouth of other people and the recommendations yeah do do you think it's harder do you think it's harder to be a good social recruiter um with a a shit brand behind you (laughs) um it is harder yes however um the quality the the best people within the social media recruiting field who use social media well often stand apart from the brand or agency that they work for. Sure, okay. Um, do you see what I mean? It's kind of, In the same way that mm. my agency was Cloud9, and although because my parent company decided not to do anything, I couldn't, see, couldn't seem to do anything with it after I left, I still to this day get requests as if I was Cloud9 yeah. a year on because it, Cloud9 was a brand, but the, the individual myself and not talking just about me actually i'm talking about a couple of my ex-colleagues who still get requests yeah. from candidates and clients now to get i used you and or somebody said i should use you so i think the people relationship is stronger than the brand relationship mm. for very very good recruiters because they have a kind of uh that kind of gravitas with people brands alone can't provide gravitas i think you need more layers than that personally yeah however it could be said you can have the best. So I always also will say, if you can have the best social media strategy in the world, if you but if your product's shit, then um, excuse the language, um, then um, then it ain't gonna get you anywhere because people are gonna vote with their feet. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, per- I think personally, I find it harder to, um, or, or I'm not so keen as to want to follow uh, brands on social media. I'd much rather follow an individual and have an insight into into yeah. them rather than like a company logo, for example. Yeah. I think you're not alone in that, Cameron. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, in terms of so, <laughs> I've completely lost the thread. Of, uh, <laughs> we were going, we were going with that. I, had a, I thought I was going to ask you an interesting question about personal branding, but you actually went on yeah, and covered it really well. And I was actually just thinking it's a really interesting point. Um, so, in terms of like content, Steve. That, that you uh you know put out there in the market like i love like i'm fanatical about reading the blogs that are out there and you know that i like a good youtube video about stuff and things like and and surely like just you know immersing yourself in the content that's out there in, in your industry surely like that that's a good thing isn't it i mean that's, that's a great thing i think it's essential i mean you know not everybody can be a blog writer themselves i think it's a tough thing to do not mm-hmm. everybody's made for all that but there's so much resource of knowledge and and i think that was one of the areas when i so if we take it back from almost like a startup situation when i started cloud nine and i i looked at how i wanted to integrate myself through what's going on on social media mm-hmm. it was the blogs that taught me the difference between what um the clients and candidates do and don't do it helped me yeah. become conversant with the specialists in that industry, particularly because it was a new industry. Um, and so therefore there was a lot of not knowing uh, that was going on. Um, but at the same time, every day, whatever industry we recruit in, there is new content and interesting stuff being posted about the latest stuff that's going on in that industry. And so it's good to, it's good to immerse yourself in that kind of knowledge, uh, mm-hmm. but also be aware of what the points of difference are. Because I think as much as being recognizing what good advice is, it's also recognizing the comment structure of, of blogs and, and commentary out there to try and understand what people's alternate point of view as well is. Because uh, like in any mm. subject area, we don't know a subject well enough unless we know both sides, the alternate sides of the arguments. And so that was what I used to kind of love getting involved in or listening into and chi- chiming into with what people were disagreeing with as much as what they were agreeing with, because that then helped you form 
one, your own understanding of what's going on, but also your own beliefs as to what's right and wrong as well. And so that was always a part of it as well. So when we, uh, reading content isn't just for reading, just for pure, simplistic kind of knowledge kind of things. Yeah. So I think it's as much to try and understand the, what the voice of the industry is and what the tone of what people are saying is. And what that means then is when, as a recruitment person, sitting in front of a client or a candidate at any given time, you're, they're kind of unexpectedly un unarmed by your knowledge and awareness that you can have a, a conversation about their technical aspects of their roles and their environments and their company mm -hmm. based on the knowledge you have. And, and sadly, recruitment people are not sufficiently, um, as, as usually as eloquent of, of those kind of technical elements of, of the people we recruit. And so it surprises people quite a lot when they realize they can actually have a conversation with somebody about their stuff and it'd be, um, it'd be understood. Steve, Steve, why do you think people are not as, you know, don't understand that stuff as much? Um, we, we, we are, I, I find, because I've worked in it, well, you know, I find there are too many recruitment agencies that are focused only on the journey between attract, getting job, attracting candidates, putting candidates in front of jobs, filling jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's a repetitive situation mm -hmm. that, um, that, as we're told by some recruitment leaders, you keep repeating that and do it more and more often, the, the, those key components, key KPIs, um, you'll get make lots of placements. That's fine. You know, and we know that to be true in many, many organizations. And who's to argue with that when it succeeds and, and you've got high billing companies? And, and, but I think, I think there are two, two or three things to think about. One is what's the most enjoyable way of doing recruitment? Is it one that is driven towards purely KPIs? Or are we allowed to have a learn, to learn and have conversations with the people around us and build a, a personality and a contribution to that? Um, secondly, where do we build long lasting relationships? Where do we build relationships that have kudos, yeah. that have kind of character? And they come from having that kind of degree of knowledge around what's going on. So, because the, the the markets out there are mature enough now to understand what good recruiters and bad recruiters look like. And that's not necessarily a difference between bad recruiters and good recruiters I'm talking about. But they understand the different layers of what a, what a, um, a recruiter they feel like they can engage with is. And I think people are smart enough now to recognize uh, and be recognize what a bad recruiter looks like or a very transactional recruiter looks like. And they're... Um, but they have a real kind of warmth towards recruiters who get what they do and can give them genuinely positive advice on where they should go, how they should go about doing it. Um, and, and also give them a little bit of knowledge about what's going on as well in the industry. Sometimes they need it too. So, so, it, so it's just the balance between those. I, I think it's just a very enjoyable. I just don't think recruitment agencies are necessarily built to be that way, basically, um, in, in the way that they set out KPIs and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that kind of leads on to my, my next question about, I mean, I think everything we've spoken about so far is great, you know, immersing yourself in content, being active on social media, things like yeah. that, but sometimes um, recruiters, not, not agency owners, but recruiters themselves are almost afraid to spend time on social media or yeah. to be looking at blogs, digesting good content, listening to a podcast during the working day because they have someone yeah. go over their shoulder and say, like, get back on that phone. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, do you think it's maybe about time that agency owners started taking a bit more responsibility for educating their recruiters? Yeah, I, I think the, the problem it's a very it's a very uneven i used to always think that it must be agency owners stopping recruiters um doing more social media interaction and using those channels to kind of develop their own brand and the, the brand they work for um and then but the more recruitment agency ceos and leaders that i spend time with the more they say it's the other way around that they would love to do it oh. but the, the the recruiters are effectively feel so one either don't find it's the most efficient route of work for them so they don't do it um or secondly in some cases it's just they're repeating the things they just want to repeat the things that they've known yeah. work perfectly fine so you know so in the same way that you know if there's a guy in your recruitment team who has billed 25 grand a month for, uh, for the last 10 years exactly the way he's always done it or she's always done it then there's no need for that person to change there's no reason for them to do anything different so so i i run so a lot of what i look at now is thinking around kind of 
if we're a recruitment agency owner, why are we trying to force recruitment consultants to be social recruiters? Why mm -hmm. is that really the thing we should be doing? Or should we be looking at kind of what the purpose and benefit of social recruiting um, is and then working out amongst across an agency kind of uh, talent uh, employee network who should be doing what and what should be the components that we should be using social for because we know that really driven recruiters only want to go and find candidates um yeah. through those networks they've got jobs all they want to do is is find candidate find candidate find candidate find candidate find candidate now rather than turning them into content loving beautiful people that kind of some people are never going to be that kind of yeah. person they're going to be so they need to be awesome at sourcing through social and understanding how they so that's the bit that they need to get right mm -hmm. so and then you start to look as you go up the tier of recruitment responsibility towards the leaders i think that's where a lot of the responsibility around social should start to come into the areas of how do we develop business and build our agency brand across network and the best people to carry agency brand and not that new yeah. kid that you just shoved on the phone um and who's just learning how to do recruitment and you also give them social as well to play with and they're like oh my god and 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 it should be the intelligent people um who have built this re uh, recruitment agency brand who are responsible for the recruitment agency brand to be integral to the markets in which they operate in so look at it from a, if 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 i'm a, an accountancy industry recruiter in reading let's yeah. say um then i I should be right at the heart of the Reading finance yeah. industry as a leader, not as, don't ask my 22 year old kid to do it, as a leader or as one of my leaders and directors of the organization. And this is one of the things I, I kind of realized with working with um, having a parent company who were the leaders in their field at the uh, PA recruitment, but none of their directors had a voice in, yeah. in the PA industry. And, and whereas, with, with their title, with their seniority, comes a degree of gravitas and um, a knowledge and years of experience that that could add um, power to the, the brand that they work for and draw business in. Um, and I think that's the that's the that's the mix that I think we've come we've started to I've start I've started to realise it's the right balance and, and um, between how we use social across recruitment teams. I think there is we have to understand what we're using mm -hmm. it for and give it to the right people i think that's, that's yeah definitely see i think that's really really interesting i mean um i was fortunate enough to go through and attend like the turing fest in edinburgh mm -hmm. um, a couple of months ago and it was full of uh, tech leaders from all different uh, all different mm -hmm. major major companies were, were in attendance and they all I, I can't think of one of them that didn't have a social ceo as yeah. it were to coin right. the phrase yeah. you know like someone who had a great social brand behind them they were absolutely fantastic active and active uh, with blogging active on content and it was all you know you're right it's not necessarily all of the the other people lower down the lower down that, that had that it was all the ceos that yeah. built those great great brands i never thought of it that way um, yeah. and and recruiting it's really interesting to get that point of view yeah i i think it's you know it's a really interesting point and you mentioned the word like leaders and, and leadership like multiple times there i think it's interesting in terms of you've got the dynamic of a recruitment agency where you know most recruitment leaders okay until you get to a certain size tend to be billing mm. consultants as well certainly in the sme market yeah so i think a lot of what you're saying really is that the you know these people they're the people that need to lead from the front and and really like show like you know this is the way to to operate in today's market if that's what everyone is in agreement with yeah. in the agency but but why why do you think that some people because because i don't think like the people that you're talking to steve they they want to have a conversation with you because they're interested in social recruiting but why do you think people some people leaders are less keen on social recruiting than others I think because we probably shouldn't call it social recruiting. That's probably a good starting point. Is that probably the, and, or it depends on what we want to define social recruiting as. And I think that's okay. changed over the years, in my opinion, because I think what social recruiting has turned into sourcing. Mm -hmm. Sourcing is on the rise. Social recruiting, afraid, is on the the, the dip. Um, all the money's in sourcing. All the techs in sourcing. And and it's and it it's, and I think they're two different things. I think they're given that social media is a platform 
mm -hmm. area or a series of platforms in which we can find people for sourcing purposes and blah blah but that's one thing and and, and the character i read a blog earlier this year about this the characteristics of the sourcer is often very different to the characteristics of a good social recruiter mm -hmm. a good social recruiter doesn't look at social recruitment as a way of just finding candidates they look at it as a way of building brand reputation um, awareness integration within their industry um, credibility and, and leadership within their industry as well but possibly more so driving in business as a business mm -hmm. development um, model rather than a sourcing kind of model and I, I think that's where the difference lies is I think we've always seen social recruiting as a thing that brings in candidates and candidates alone and I, I, yeah. I, think, that, I think sourcing does that and social recruiting does it but I think I think it's a business development tool. I think it's a place where we win business that other agencies can't get because we're talking on another level with the right set of people um, at the right kind of level, if you see what I mean. And I, yeah. Um, I, I think I think that's the I think I just think it's a change of, of, of dynamic a little bit um, as to how things seem to work best, if you see what I mean. In, and I guess that the proof of this um, and, and one of the cha the challenges of of, of cloud nine was always that I'd have a team of people, but everybody wanted to deal with me. Now that everybody else was in my team was perfectly capable of mm -hmm. dealing with those situations in just as good a way as I was, um, because they, they were, they just were, I mean, I trained them that way, but the point is everybody wanted to do business primarily with me, particularly from a new business perspective. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it was because the, the, the brand, the personal brand bit, if you like, was partially built through a degree of seniority and credibility and knowledge that I could pass the industry about the talent market and what's changing in talent. And so my got my goal as an integrator in, in the industry was not just to learn from them, was mm -hmm. but also to be able to provide my knowledge to them to go, hey, this is how it works. This is how people, this is what people are attracted to. This is how they operate. You need to change this. You need to do this to attract people better. So we, as leaders, we're a better position to become experts in our market about the portion of our responsibility within that market. Mm -hmm. And that was about talent. And given that every company, I just went to an innovation conference a couple of weeks ago, an ideas and innovation conference, and, and listening to some phenomenal people on stage who are all CEOs and leaders of, um, of organizations, every one of them talks about how talent is the biggest challenge for them. Finding and retaining the best talent is the biggest challenge that all companies have. Um, but um, I was the only recruitment person out of 120 in the room <laughs> at the conference and yeah. and it, it made you stop made you think and think right okay why are we not in this conversation why do we not as recruitment leaders put ourselves in that conversation and and when you when i start to talk to these people over a beer afterwards certainly the early evening anyway <laughs> um, when is it, <laughs> the, i was telling them things about talent attraction that they'd never ever heard before because the ceos never talk to talent yeah. people so yet yet label it as the biggest challenge that they have and so it's remarkable I, I, I find there's a disconnect between recruitment professionals and business leaders um, and I think that is the sweet spot that recruitment agency leaders let alone in-house leaders can need to be mm -hmm. in the conversation bit more and influencing change of mindset and that's a great way to win business is to be yeah. amongst the people who, who tend to spend the money and, and that kind of stuff yeah, I, I think it, I think it's a really interesting point, Steve. It's just like it's kind of smacking you in the face. There's a huge opportunity there, isn't it? It's like you know, why, why is no one filling this gulf? But I don't know. Like a, a lot of um, certainly, like when I speak to a lot of kind of CEOs of companies outside of the recruitment sector, you know, a lot of them are like want to actually keep recruiters at arm's length. Yeah, yeah. You know, because and because they think they you know they think really all it's about is going to be a sales conversation um yeah and and do you do you feel like that's where people maybe like fail when they uh, they think about like using social media and their recruitment businesses they yeah. they basically go out and they treat it like another phone <laughs> you know? so it's yeah. like, and you see it as happen as I mean, connect with somebody has been like oh, i'm gonna give him a pitch right yeah exactly uh, and you see it on um you see it on linkedin you see it on stuff they it can't stop that sales approach. And look, I mean, and look, it might work sometimes. I mean, it's that thing. If you throw mud at the wall enough time, you'll get something stick. And, and that might work for some people, but it's the knock on effects of the credit. It's the credibility thing. I always go back to is, is when you, div when you, you have a voice 
I think recruitment people have a struggle having a voice, um, a genuine um, content and comment that's worth hearing to CEOs and, and, and obviously not in all cases. And I think we know a lot of very, very smart people in the recruitment agency industry. And I know a lot of super, super smart recruiters who are genuinely experts in their field and genuinely have a comment to say around their field and their not area of knowledge. And they add value to the people that they're dealing with on any yeah. given basis because they have knowledge. Um, and without necessarily needing to say the words, can I have a job? And, and I, I don't think I've yeah, funny enough, just saying those words. I don't think of asked, can I have a job, which is kind of known as being one of those things you must always ask, make sure you ask for a job. Um, I don't think I've asked anybody for a, a job in nearly 15 years. I don't think I've asked a company to please give me a job uh, to work on in the last 15 years. You have to put yourself in a position where they, the best relationships are built where they choose you because yeah. your authority is such that, um, and that you it's it's a no-brainer it's like it's almost like inevitable that you'll be given the job in it yeah. and but you can't do that through a sales pitch alone i think you've got to do that through um real educated logical thinking and understanding of what's involved there was a conversation on 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 um on linkedin this morning that i just got involved with and it was actually a rec to rec asking how they headhunt um I, I, I kind of been moaning that people weren't responding to him as headhunt as a headhunter and mm. you know saying well come on recruitment people you're kind of you're in a talent short market you should you've got all the opportunities in front of you um give me 30 seconds and i and I, my response was that's no way to recruit anybody you where's the value <laughs> where's the value why do you you know how, how can you present i mean if, if somebody wanted to headhunt me for a role within a recruitment agency one i'd need to know what the recruitment agency is two i've got to be aligned to their values and what they're responsible for three i've got to really understand what it is around the organization that they're doing and how they're impacting a market four i really want to understand the objectives of the leaders and all that kind of stuff um and and then i might have a stop and have a conversation with you because then i've got some meat to work off it means we can have a proper conversation not it's 30 second malarkey yeah. um, let's have a proper conversation on a business le on a, you know senior business level about this and that's the same with the way we treat our clients is the same kind of thing around if we if we, if we treat people at, the, at a level that is educational to each and one another then um then all of a sudden the the, the relationship is stronger it holds more kind of weight and gravitas and um and that compels people to give you work. It's yeah. um, rather than a pitch gives a job. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I, I like the example that you used there, Steve, and what about why credibility is important. The big thing I was kind of taken out of that was like, if you don't have credibility, it's like you, you can, yeah, you, what you can actually ask people for or, or what you get from people goes down and down and down to the yeah, point where that yeah. guy's actually scrambling to get 30 seconds of someone's time. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing effective you can do in 30 seconds. But that stems exactly what you were saying, Alan, about the fact that, again, when somebody says recruiter, people kind of, the hairs go off of the back of their net and they kind of coil at the thought of, of a recruiter. And that's, mm. and look, that's irreversible now. We, we can't, you know, that, that's been, the growth of the recruitment industry, unfortunately, is as, as, made that happen because it became such a dog eat dog industry and everybody got a little bit kind of uh, knickers and twist about it and, and you, you I, we can't reverse that so only, the only things we can do are make individual patterns of of, mm. of good pro you can only be the recruiter you want to be ultimately and um and the way clients want you to be i don't think we're going to change the industry as a whole yeah. but it's it's always nice to know you can mm. point to beacons of of specialization within each industry yeah. that you can go go to that guy go to this lady go to this person and that's mm -hmm. i think that's the best we can do now i don't think we can reverse the recruitment industry sadly there's a couple of questions or a couple of points coming in the sidebar steve that i'd like to introduce yeah. as well and um, one from sally she's saying a little bit about you know saying about how we need to educate mm -hmm. recruiters on content um yes. You know, if you are a, a recruitment agency owner and you've not really delved into that side of it before mm -hmm. and you don't really know where to get started or what to do, I mean, what's mm -hmm. what's your advice if you're in that position? Yeah, I would encourage agency owners to have a, um, a voice, uh, a phrase I've used quite a few times um, in there. That's the point. Is It's like, how can you write content that gives you a point of difference to other people? Now, I believe any, I, I believe a large percentage of recruitment agency leaders if we're going to use agency context are perfectly capable of writing a, a very effective piece of writing 
uh, about their opinions on the industry, their recruit, their exploration into it. Um, but the point is, you, one, you have to work out what your area of expertise is. You have mm -hmm. to you have to understand what at that point, what would you want to be known for? Um, and secondly, what is that unique point of view that you have that will set you apart from other people uh, within that industry um and and it's to try and find an avenue that other people don't tread a little bit and we've all got them but we don't often stop to think about what our unique point of differentiation is mm -hmm. um, whether it's the individual's personal differentiation or it's the the company they operate for i would err towards the personal um opinion that supports the company that you operate um so i think if you stop i always find if you put 10 recruitment agency owners in a room and throw a subject at them. They'll fight each other about it for <laughs> an hour quite comfortably yeah. with their mouths. Um, if you mm -hmm. can then articulate some of that comment and voice on in word, then that would be absolute gold, absolute gold. But it's the journey, it's the mental journey to think, I can say this stuff, but can I put it in a word? I, I still find time now to do a couple of blogs a month. It's probably about as much as I can manage um, just from time but i tend to find when i do it i whack it out in half an hour i just kind of get it done start it and clear it's a, something that's in my brain and i just got shift an hour half an hour aside and I go, i'm going to write it and blah, blah blah and i might tweak it a little bit later in the day and send it out but you need to put the words as almost like a stream of consciousness yeah onto the page and then start to spend a second time a little later just kind of articulating what it should look like and all that. but it doesn't have to be war and peace yeah. it doesn't have to be shakespeare um yeah. And it, and it can be, and it, and it certainly doesn't have to be Garrick Savage. It can be, it, you know, it can be what, it can be short, you know, some of the Seth Godin, if anybody ever yeah, read yeah. Seth Godin's kind of blogs and, and, and they're often the shortest little things, but they're very poignant because he's got a great way with words. So um, I don't have short ways of words as you can tell. <laughs> I, just, I have to write long ones. <laughs> yeah, I actually think Steve as well on content. I mean, it's a really good point. There's a lot of people that like when I, you know, when I talk to them about uh, you know content marketing and creating content, and they're like, oh, I know I should be doing something. I should be writing a blog, but I'm terrible at writing. And actually, the reason that a lot of people get into more kind of sales-focused jobs yeah. is it, it's not because they're great at writing; it's because they're good at selling. They're good writing yeah. in front of people yeah. and. Yeah. I think people should also look at the different channels that are there for them right now. Like, I mean, th this is one, but I mean, you can use, yeah. like, you can do your own video, you can get your phone out, oh, you can do a Facebook yeah. Live, you can do yeah. whatever it is and, and you know, talk about something that's interesting in the industry. And if you're, you know, a quite an enthusiastic and a compelling individual, which a lot of, you know, uh, recruiters are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think there's some great opportunities there. Yeah, I just, I just think the word is voice. I think that's the point to get again, is kind of, is, is have that voice. And every... Every recruitment agency mm -hmm. has a voice. They have an opinion and, and, and how they think work, the work, world should work and how business should be done. And or indeed, remember who your, your remember who your target market is and what they want to read as well. That's another important part of that. Is if you're gonna mm -hmm. if there's a stream of people you want it to be in, which tends tends to be that candidate kind of client kind of pool, then you need to find what your voice is in that kind of zone that they would want to talk to. I think that's the danger of writing content that's just to recruiters, is that you, you end up being a bubble and not looking outside. So it's it's important to understand who wants to read stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think as well, like well, one of the things that we certainly notice is that agency owners sometimes are a little bit um, unsure of if they're going to get a return of investment from doing this. Already just yeah. noticed in the comments there that guys are already starting to get a return of investment from Good, it, right? yeah. which is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're if you're apprehensive, well, if you're watching this and you're apprehensive about getting a, getting an ROI from it, um, for yourself, Steve, is this brand and the content and stuff you put to market had a, a helped you make money? Yes, well, it has to, otherwise you you do really do guys. Well, we chose one route, so we chose a pure social route because of the market that we were in. They were pro I mean, we we were in a position where we could because the whole of our market was generally digital professionals. So you've already got the potential of a live and active audience and people naturally swimming around that space. So it made it easier to have a social recruiting heavy kind of focus um, versus sales. Um, the ROI bit is the bit that people have got to really kind of spend some time working out what you want to get from mm -hmm. it. Um, the bit that you have to work in the same way that people struggle with ROI on any kind of marketing, 
um, advertising, that kind of stuff. We, it's an area we we bang our heads against sometimes. It's the hardest bits to measure, uh, but actually sometimes the easiest bits to measure. But um, the um, is to think about what it does to support your sales effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way to look at it is, I, I think for, for most typical recruitment agencies um, and organizations, making sure whatever happens online through social and the kind of conversations you create there naturally dovetails with what you're doing from a sales activity point of view. Given that recruitment agencies aren't like Cloud9 and don't just do the pure marketing, communication, social media stuff alone, most agencies will still have a 70, 80% lean towards sales versus uh, versus marketing. But the, the way I've always looked at it is having run recruitment agencies and a, a recruitment agency departments for a number of years, my, my biggest frustrations as a recruitment agency uh, director and manager was seeing my database of clients, let's say a thousand clients, was seeing that we'd only were having an impact with let's say 150 okay. out of a thousand target companies yeah. because they were the only ones we could actually talk to on the phone and get any kind of partial mileage but even then 100 of those are probably kind of telling us to clear off and come back you know next month or something or other and, and actually a, a, such a high proportion of the um uh the the content we would do on the on the database is no jobs call next month, wouldn't take my call, receptionist wouldn't be sorting me through, blah, blah. And, and, and even way back in the 90s, I used to say to people, well, don't just use that route then, find another way of contacting people. So if we look at the overall objective of what we're trying to do as a recruitment agency, which is try and convert the best quality and most amount of those companies into being our clients, yeah. um, then we our phone calling sales methods hit, we know they hit a certain portion of it, let's say 20%. Um, but there's another 80% of companies out there that clearly will not pick the phone up yeah. to us. And therefore, what we have to do is stop digging our heels into the, the I've got to make phone calls kind of sand yeah. and start thinking about where do these people actually exist and where do they communicate and where are they off guard and where do they feel at home. So, and if we, and it's working out then how do we find another way of getting them? And obviously social is naturally one of those areas, events being out and about there and being visible and all that kind of stuff is another way as well. So it's all about a blended approach to reach the ultimate same kind of goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's fair to say if we track our activity with clients effectively, we'll start to understand where the tipping points are with some clients yep. as to where we um, engage with them and get business um, and others. And some of it will be on the phone and some of it will be online. Some of it, hopefully, will be a combination of the two just absolutely fitting perfectly. Yeah. So that when we do call them, they go, oh, it's those guys producing that blog and that commented who commented on my thing last week. And all of a sudden, the, the change of dynamic of how they receive you is, is huge. Yeah. So, that's, so when people ask about the ROI question, I always, I always will refer back to the kind of the fact it shouldn't be measured as an isolation piece. The only way it always works effectively to most organizations is if it's, if it's dovetailed together as a, as a kind of a, a complete sales plan, a complete business development plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Steve, I want to ask you as well. I mean, see, seeing the in the conversations and stuff that you get involved in online, this is a little bit off piece as well. But in terms of like social listening, you always seem to get involved in good conversations <laughs> <laughs> online. I mean, if you're an agency, yeah. if you're an agency owner and you're looking for conversations to get involved in. Do you have any tips for that, or, or you know, where where do you find these chats take place? Or yeah, identify the people you want to do. So if I've sat and worked with a with a recruitment agency CEO, so this is the process I kind of go through. Uh, I I ask them what the fifty companies are that they would love to do business with. Remember, this is the founder, CEO, senior directors of recruitment agencies. Yeah. So we're not talking about asking their recruiters to do this. We're talking about them to go right. Who are the fifty companies you wish your um, business your agency would do business with and say who they are then work out the people you want to be associated with there might be one or two people in each of those companies or whatever you want to be associated with then do a search just to find where these people exist so there's a bit of an exercise to start but you have to everything starts by building some blocks and all that kind of stuff yep. and and you there's an exercise to go and then try and identify where those people exist okay and um, um, populate online find out the ones that write content find out the kind of places where they talk Find out where they get engaged in, other events they go to, et cetera. And then start bit by bit to infiltrate your part of the conversation mm -hmm. into their part of the conversation. It, and in, 
it really is that simple that it's just but it has to start from a very targeted start point mm -hmm. um uh, that you're identifying who your key targets are mm -hmm. that you think you as an agency leader or an agency director let's say if you're not necessarily the, the ceo of a larger organization um who should you and and what that is then because agency directors don't like doing business development <laughs> uh, not not the old-fashioned way not the cold calling way anymore they, you know again they've got people they employ people to do all that kind of stuff now but the point is this kind of engagement is is um it's more fun it's more enjoyable it's real it's human it's it's like being going to a, a little local networking gig and having a chat about what's going on in the industry and all that kind of stuff to me they are as valuable as and possibly even more valuable than any sales call that any person can pick up mm -hmm. uh, because again it goes back to that credibility thing you're part of a con you're being part of the conversation with the right people in the the right places and that kind of and like i say you get you surprise people when you're a recruiter in those places they don't expect to see you there yeah. and, but as long as you don't sound like a recruiter that's the the that was way back when when yeah. the first person told who told me how to do stuff the social a guy called Raja Nand, who I went and did social strategy training with, he said to me, it's like one thing you have to do is don't act like a recruiter. Because yeah. because exactly what Alan said earlier. It's like mm -hmm. you you um you act like a recruiter the way people expect you to be recruiters, they'll they'll you'll piss them off. Yeah. Uh, if you act like a human being who the genuine um kind of uh, learning wants within the industry, they'll like you. You're part of their conversation. It's different. So um, the liking bit is kind of a big part of it as well. But yeah, so that's what I do. I'd find, be really targeted, know who you want to aim for and identify where they exist in that conversation. Some great advice because I think sometimes people don't really know where to get started with that. They're not really sure where to go or where to find the conversations. So it's really good. Do you think that um, being a social, like an active social recruiter, Steve, has cost you um, easy placements? Like, uh, uh, you know, jump on a CV database, there's a CV phone number, do you want in the job? Yeah, mm. totally it has. I. I never ever liked doing that kind of um, recruitment in any case. I used to find it just no fun. Quick wins were never <laughs> quick wins were never easy. I, I, I think there's a difference between yeah cheap easy placements that they're out there and all that kind of stuff. And the, the balance between a you know one agency and another agency often is there are the low hanging fruit that people will go for and mm -hmm. they are quick wins and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine and that's good for some agencies. Um, and and who who would Saying that. I, we just didn't go for that. We went for very, you know, we went for the stuff that was really, really acutely right for us and our kind of talent pool. Um, the, the stuff where people chose us rather than we, us picking off. Yeah. Um, and there's something to be said for trying to avoid the easy ones. We found it with one client that we ended up working with where we ended up having a lot of vacancies. Fantastic, a lot of it. But of course, it also <laughs> turned out to be the client with the highest turnover in London and, and every agency in town had the job. And therefore, you, you every time you sat with a with a candidate to say, "Hey, look, I've got a job at such and such," a, they go, "Yeah, with you and five other people that have already talked to me about it." And all that. so, the easy hanging fruit does that do your agency any credibility? Probably not, but it gets you a few fees, which is good. So, um, no, we went we went for a different model. I, I, we we never went for the high growth. We went for the we liked being the um, the the player within a market, the yeah. the credible mm -hmm. player in a market. But I think to get an agency growth the way that most people would want their agency growth to be if you want to go for scaling. Yep. Of course, remember, most agencies actually don't worry about scaling uh, that much. But if you do, you have to balance. Yeah. That, 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 yeah. I think I said earlier about balancing sales and, and, and the social marketing stuff and, and content stuff um, in tandem with each other rather than one as opposed to the other. Yeah. Great. Um, cool. Alan, any, anything else? Any more questions from you just now? I... No, no, I just want to obviously. I've got the answer to everything. We're, we're fine, aren't we? Between the I'm, three of us, we're uh, I'm brilliant. Uh, brilliant, uh, I'm brilliant, brilliant content. No, I think like just plug like Steve's uh, podcast as well, get him some more. <laughs> listens the on the 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 recruitment podcast. Uh, there's, uh, there's a couple of uh, other sort of comments that came in on the right there as well. Yeah. Uh, one from uh, Adam asking about um, Matt Charney's blog. Um, says it's really, really good, but he think finds it's a little bit too long. And, and Stephen O'Donnell saying that he's never, never read a whole one. Do you, do you read Matt's blog? No, I don't. I can't no. get past on that too, too power. Um, I'm sure he's a fantastic writer, and and I am rather like Stephen. I, um, I, God, it's too long. Um, it, I don't have time um, or the attention span to um, to read it. I, it's got to be damn good early and and to really keep me going. But even then, uh, I think I would. 
you know, I would, uh, I can, t- I, I know it myself because I've sometimes written a blog. Of, I've looked at afterwards and thought it's a little bit too long, but I can get away with it now and again. Yeah. Uh, if you've got the right subject matter and it's laid out in the right kind of way and all that kind of stuff. And look, Matt's a way better writer than I am. And Matt's a proper writer. I'm, I'm just a recruiter who writes a bit, but it's, but uh, I think you've got to think about who the readers are. Now, I think with Matt's world, whether it be probably quite a lot of tech people yeah. um, who want to get knowledge about the market and changes and trends, I think it's a lot, it's quite important for them to imbibe that kind of information and, and make decisions off the back of it. I think if we're providing content for our client and candidate market, um, I think we have to be a little bit um, sure about what we're trying to get across and much faster and cleaner um, in, in the way we deliver. That's like I say, it's not down to down Matt's uh, blog. It's for the right audience. But I think yeah. for the audiences we deal with, I think a degree of brevity isn't the worst uh, mm-hmm. thing to train ourselves in. Yeah. yeah. I know you said earlier on as well about when you guys were putting your content out, you always just wrote it for a, like a, a person rather than trying to distinguish between a client and a, and a candidate, yeah. as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Quite often when I speak to recruiters, one of the things they don't know about is like, that they're not sure, like, am I writing this for a client or am I writing it for a candidate? Um, mm-hmm. And I suppose that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier on about um, the um, not, not, not differentiating. Yeah, not differentiating, but I mean, yeah. if, uh, do you have any more uh, advice around about that? I mean, for... I think it stems, I tell you where this, this is probably an important part of this is, is this stems from the fact that to build some kind of social recruiting gravitas that I'm referring to, we have to stop purely thinking of our clients mm-hmm. being internal HR and recruitment people. Um, Cause that's where we make the phone calls to mm-hmm. tends to be HR people and internal talent people. Uh, ironically, the people who never have time to take the call because they've got too many damn jobs to look after. Um, but but we can't. It's difficult to build gravitas, build gravitas with TA people mm-hmm. and recruitment talent people. It's easier to build gravitas with the if we're accounting firm, the finance directors. If we're a digital marketing recruiter, the heads of digital. Mm-hmm. If you're a technology recruiter, the the CIOs and all that kind of stuff, or, or whatever CTOs and all that kind of stuff. So. That is a layer, you know, when I look at talk about like that credibility thing that directors of the of, of recruitment agencies should have, yep. that it, it should be thinking about that target audience rather than the talent attractor. Because I won business with clients um, like, you know, The Guardian, Telegraph Media Group, BBC, um, big, big companies, but through their talent acquisition team, because their talent acquisition team were the ones that rung me and say, I've been told I need to talk to you. Um, and it's because the heads of digital or the heads of social media said, right, we need to hire some people. Mm-hmm. Go, go to Steve because oh, okay. he's the guy who, um, so they're directed and influenced by the people who have got the pain point of the empty desk. Um, and so, so that's the mindset of that is that, and this is where, again, this is where that mindset of recruitment agencies, when we say there's clients and there's candidates, we tend to think of candidates who are specialists in the area of recruiting and clients who are a bunch of recruit who people who recruit yeah. Um, yeah. TA people. R- the third layer is the layer where you impact influence, I believe, rather than the in-house TA, who frankly couldn't give a no. damn whether you're the b- because they've got so many agencies knocking their door, um, they can't differentiate easily. And so, um, so that's the point when I say that, and I probably should have educate, uh, articulated that better earlier. But that's a really important point about where your credibility with industry comes mm. from. Um, and, and that's still, like I say, sometimes that means you miss the gig still sometimes because you end up missing out on the job that the, where the, the head of digital guy didn't influence yeah. the TA at the right moment and blah, blah. Hey, look, that sometimes happens. But yeah, it's nice to deal with those people that they, and their, their influence because the other aspect is, is the people who recommend you to other people in the industry are those people as well. They're, it's the, it's the, the people who have the same kind of jobs and the same challenges across the industry who recommend you. It's not always the talent acquisition people yeah. um, who recommend you. So that's probably an important a bit. And then all of a sudden you can see why candidates and clients are exactly the yeah. same but yeah. because it's, it's the people who do the vertical, who operate within the vertical that you, you operate in. That's absolutely fantastic advice, Steve. I think a lot of people, that's a question that often often crops up, like who are we writing for? And I think you've nailed that there. Yeah. It's really good. 
Yeah, I do. Steve, if folk are looking to get in touch with you, I know this has all been a bit social recruiting. I'm sure they'll be able to find you. But if someone is looking to get in touch with you, um, yeah, uh, come in, come, yeah. all sorts of places online. I think, yeah, I think I, 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 I'm still cloud nine in lots of places. You see, really, because because um, that's just where the, that's legacy, really. But um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, Steve Warden, the forward slash in my LinkedIn uh, uh, URL is cloud nine rec. I think if you look for Steve Warden cloud nine on on um, on Google, you'll find me. Um, I've also got a blog, therecruitmentmisfit.com, which I don't do as much with a blog as a blog now because I use LinkedIn more, but um, but that's a place to get hold of me as well. Twitter, Cloud9 Reg. You know, you keep finding me. Steve Ward and Cloud9, you can <laughs> get me. Brilliant, Steve. Well, Steve, thank you very much for, for your Pleasure. time today. Really, me. really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having thanks me. Thanks, everyone, for coming in and joining yes, us. Nice. Appreciate it. Cheers, Cheers Steve. See you later. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye.